In this video, I want to talk about the role of solvents in nucleophilic substitution reactions, specifically SN1 and SN2 reactions, and how the SN1 and SN2 reactions are affected by either polar protic and polar aprotic solvents. So here I've drawn a list of polar protic solvents that you'll commonly encounter. And the most important thing to note for each of these different solvents is just to think back to oxygen and hydrogen and think about the different electronegativities we have between oxygen and hydrogen. Remember, oxygen has a pretty high electronegativity, about 3.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.2. And we kind of think of electronegativity as greed for electrons, so it pulls electrons towards itself. That means that when oxygen and hydrogen are bonded together, we're going to have oxygen pulling a lot of this electron density towards it. In this bond between oxygen and hydrogen, we're going to have a partial negative charge on the oxygen, partial positive charge on our hydrogen. And this leads to this uh, adjacent, these adjacent charges, which are called, this is called a dipole. It's called a dipole, and we have adjacent opposite charges. And this comes Actually, this is part of the reason why these are called polar protic solvents because of this dipole and the fact that we have this, such a large electronegativity difference here, 3.5 and 2.2, means that these are very polar. This is a very polar molecule, water. And as we re replace hydrogen with different lengths of carbon chains, uh, we can get either methanol or ethanol. And these are other examples of polar protic solvents. Uh, in the case of methanol, of course, we still have a partial negative charge on our oxygen or partial positive charge on our hydrogen. And we might have a little bit of a partial positive charge on our carbon as well. But remember, carbon's got an electronegativity of about 2.5, so it's, it's not going to play as big a role. And uh, ethanol, the same applies here, partial negative and partial positive. And as we go on, we could continue uh, increasing the length of the chain and and these would still consider, be considered, um, we'd have a polar group on our alcohol. Now the whole protic, where the protic comes from in polar protic solvents is, remember what a proton is. Proton is H plus. So in each of these molecules I've described so far, we have a partial positive charge on our hydrogen. So they're not protons specifically, or, but they are protic in the sense that we have a partial positive charge on our hydrogen. So that's what makes these solvents polar protic. So it's a partial positive charge on our hydrogen. So here's two more examples of polar protic solvents. We have acetic acid here, acetic acid, a partial negative on oxygen and partial positive on hydrogen. And then we have this molecule is called ammonia. And you think about ammonia, nitrogen actually is a pretty electronegative element too, right? It's got electronegativity about three. So uh, between nitrogen and hydrogen, there's a fairly large electronegativity difference. So we're gonna have a partial negative charge on our nitrogen and a partial positive charge on our hydrogen. So again, we're gonna have a dipole here with, with ammonia. So these are all examples of, of polar protic solvents and uh, at this point, you might be asking, well, what's the point? So why does it matter that we just we're discussing polar protic solvents? And the answer is that polar protic solvents have a very special ability to do what we call hydrogen bonding. And what that is and how this impacts substitution reactions in particular is water molecules stick together so well. Water has such a high boiling point because we have hydrogen bonds between the positively charged hydrogens and the negatively charged oxygens. And these dipoles can line up and there's are attractive interactions which, which give it a high boiling point. And hydrogen bonding can also impact nucleophiles. So if I have a nucleophile and I have it in a polar protic solvent like water, what's gonna happen is, well, Remember that the key rule of organic chemistry and chemistry in general is that opposite charges attract, like charges repel. So if we have a negatively charged nucleophile in water, the partial positive charges of water are going to line up with our negative charge of the nucleophile. This is going to be an attractive interaction. 
And what this means is that everywhere the nucleophile goes, it's going to have this shell of solvent molecules around it. And the ability of the molecules of solvent to surround it is going to be proportional to how, um, how well the nucleophile can hydrogen bond. So uh, the, that can play into the role. The most important role there would be would be probably be basicity. So the more basic a nucleophile is, the more it could hydrogen bond. So the key thing here is that hydrogen bonding, okay, now hydrogen bonding is, if it occurs, it's gonna decrease our nucleophilicity. Why is that? Well, like I said, everywhere it goes, no, this nucleophile has this entourage of solvent molecules around it. And this is going to make it more hindered, less free uh, than it would normally be to react with an electrophile in a substitution reaction. So hydrogen bonding decreases nucleophilicity. And this is most important for the SN2 reaction. Uh, you can also think of it in terms of steric bulk in that you have a, a solvent shell around your nucleophile. And this is increasing the, the, the size, if you will, the bulkiness of your nucleophile, which is gonna slow your reaction uh, down to a considerable extent. So the bottom line is that hydrogen bonding decreases nucleophilicity. Let's talk about, not that, yes, let's talk about polar aprotic solvents. So polar aprotic solvents are uh, also polar solvents. And if we think about, again, electronegativity differences, we have oxygen and sulfur, so oxygen's partially negative and sulfur's partially positive, and nitrogen's partially negative and carbon's partially positive, and we can draw these dipoles in. Again, these are other examples of dipoles. Partial negative, partial negative, partial positive. These are other examples of dipoles. So they're dipoles, the fact that they have dipoles means that they are polar, but look what's missing in each of these examples. They're aprotic in the sense that there's no OH bonds and there's no NH bonds. So in other words, there's no hydrogen bonding. There's no hydrogen bonding. Now, each of these solvents, uh, this is gonna have an impact on nucleophilicity as we'll see in a second. Each of these solvents have names. So this is called dimethyl sulfoxide or DMSO, this is called acetonitrile, or sometimes abbreviated MECN. This is called acetone. It's usually commonly used as a paint thinner or nail polish remover. This is DMF. This is NN dimethyl formamide. And Finally, this one, I'll just give the abbreviation. I won't write out the full name. This is called HMPA or hexamethyl phosphorus trianide. So these are all examples of solvents. They're liquids and they're polar, but they're aprotic. So there's no OH or NH bonds. So what this means is that if we use a polar aprotic solvent, the nucleophile is more free more free than it would be in an SN, uh, than it would be in a polar protic solid. So our nucleophile is more free, it's going to be a faster reaction, uh, which is better for SN2. Okay, so it's going to be a better reaction for, it's going to lead to increased rates for SN2 reactions because there's, there's no hydrogen bonding which is, which is affecting our nucleophilicity. So finally, let's just boil it all down to what is the bottom line for nucleophilic substitution reactions according to the different solvents. So in SN2 reactions, these are going to be faster in polar aprotic solvents. Um, and in polar aprotic solvents, the order of nucleophilicity, for example, 
it's going to go in the order F minus is greater than CL minus, which is greater than VR minus, which is greater than I minus. And for polar protic solvents, it's a lot slower. So it's slower in polar protic. Slower in polar protic solvents. And that's because we have hydrogen bonding. Um, we have hydrogen bonding in polar protic solvents, and that's going to make our nucleophile a much uh, poorer nucleophile. Now what about SN1 reactions? We haven't really talked much about SN1 reactions. Well, as it turns out, they are much, they tend to be faster in polar protic solvents. And why is that? Well, part of the reason is that polar protic solvents just tend to be more polar, tend to be more polar than, than polar aprotic solvents overall, but they can also this hydrogen bonding is also important because they can hydrogen bond with the leaving group. So if we imagine, remember what happens in the first step of the SN1 reaction, let's say we had our uh, a Br minus. So we had a tertiary alkyl bromide and we lose our Br. And this, the slow step of this reaction is the leaving group leaves. Well, if we do this in a polar protic solvent, we're going to have a negative charge bromine. And this could be, to some extent, stabilized by hydrogen bonding with, let's say we use water as solvent. So at least this would help to stabilize our, our negative charge to some extent. And also the positive charge would also be stabilized by interaction with the nucleophile. And in fact, remember that in most cases, the nucleophile is the solvent. And this is what we call solvolysis. Solvolysis. So if we used water as the solvent for this SN1 reaction, then we could have water coming in and this is ultimately what is going to act as a nucleophile with our carbocation. But I said hydrogen bonding helps in that it's going to help to stabilize our leaving group as it leaves. So for that reason, uh, polar protic solvents are going to increase the rate of your, hydro of your uh, SN1 reactions.